yeah, gotta keep it 100. Uh, time to highlight the power people, yeah, all the people of color. Yeah, you know this is Brown and Money. Brown and Money, Brown and Money. Brown and money. This yeah. is Brown and Money. Brown and Money, Brown and Money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, tune in, this is major. major. You know we gotta show love to the darker shaded movers and shakers. For real, this is Brown and Money. Brown and Money, Brown and Money. Let's go. This is Brown and Money. Brown and Money, Brown and Money, yeah. Hello, guys, and welcome to Brown and Money, a podcast where we talk about entrepreneurs of color from our past so they can help us with our future. I am your host. Tiffy T, the resale queen, or Tiffany Tracy. Uh, I am so, so happy with the reception that we have been getting. Uh, I really appreciate all of the emails, uh, some places where you're able to put comments. I really appreciate those. Thank you for visiting my website and uh, using the contact form to talk to me about uh, different people that you want to learn about. Uh, I so appreciate that, and I will be happy, happy, happy to uh, work on those things for you guys. So we're going to get into today's show. So today's show, we are going to talk about Thomas L. Jennings. So who is Thomas L. Jennings? Well, if you go to look him up online, the first thing you're going to see is that he was the first African American to receive a patent. So, in this episode, we're going to discuss some of his early life. We're going to talk about how he got his start in his industry, uh, some of the challenges that uh, he was met with, because, you know, he was black, so he had some challenges, and <laughs> because they couldn't always let a black man run a business and have a patent. They wasn't trying to have all of that, <laughs> but he, he did his thing. And then we're going to talk about some notable things uh, about him and his family. And then at the end, you're going to get my commentary, like you do all the time. So, today's intimate portrait is on Thomas L. Jennings. Thomas L. Jennings was born in 1791 in New York. He was actually born a free man, which is part of the reason why people were mad about his patent. But because he was a free man, that made this very important. So in my researches, uh, I found one date of birth and it said January 1st. I thought that was kind of suspect because I don't know if someone just threw that on there or if they had real proof that that was his actual date of birth but we know enough to know that he was born in 1791. I did not get to find out information about his parents. Uh, that information, uh, it's a, that's, that's a lot more digging that uh, Tiffany would have to do. If, I, if anyone does know any information would like to be, uh, and would like to be interviewed, please contact me. I, this man's story really fascinates me. So, as I said, he was born in 1791 in New York City. He became a free man. And well, actually, he was born a free man, excuse me, not became. He was already born that way. <laughs> so, the information that we have about him when it comes to his early life is that he had many different jobs, many different odd jobs. Uh, the job that got him to where he was, to where he could get the patent, is that he became an apprentice uh, for a major, major tailor. And he got so good that he became a tailor, a tailor, and he opened up his own store. And it was a clothing store in New York City, uh, which would now be modern day Manhattan. So he had a clothing store that people came to far and wide. He was very well known for his tailoring. That's the skill that he had. He was known for that. <laughs> uh, the, the patent didn't come about until, until later. So he was known for this. So he did marry. He married a woman by the name of Elizabeth. 
uh, who, from what I understand, was born a slave, but somehow became free. I don't know how. Uh, he had three children, one named Elizabeth, one named James, and another one named Matilda. And we are going to talk a little bit about some of his children because their lives are interesting as well. So, as I said, in his early life, he worked odd jobs and then he became an he became an apprentice to a tailor and then he was able to go out on his own. So, what got that's what got his start into the industry uh, was he was a very sought after, after tailor. So, what got him to the patent? He has the patent for something called dry sourcing or scorching. I think it's sourcing, um, which is what's known today as modern day dry cleaning. Ha, ah, you didn't know that it was a black man that, that made that happen. It makes sense if they had us washing all the clothes anyway, it made sense. But anyway, I digress. Uh, and if before you start saying it's some French person, no, 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 no. It was a black man, okay? So the reason why this patent even came, came about is because uh, Thomas's customers kept coming to him because they were having problems with trying to clean some of their garments that he's made for them. And he must have used like a lot of, he used a lot of different fabrics. Uh, I believe one of the most used fabrics back then was wool. Uh, makes sense you know, cotton, uh, you know, cotton using uh, also off a of sheep. So he came up with a process to get garments cleaned for his customers. Uh, from, what I, from what I've read, he didn't like the fact that his customers um, couldn't wear his designs anymore, which makes sense. You know, one might think, uh, well, if they can't wear the designs, then they'll buy another one. All right, y'all have to look at what time this was. I mean, it's not like how it is today where you open up your closet and you got 50 million outfits that you've only worn two to three times. This was a different time. Um, you may only have, honestly, a regular person, regular everyday working person, may only have a couple different outfits and they may have that one nice outfit uh, to go to church or to go to an event. Um, you didn't often, that wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing to just go out and purchase clothes every day. That they didn't, it wasn't, it was accessible to most, but I mean, a lot of people back then honestly were making their own clothes. So it wasn't like, you know, you just go on Fashion Nova and see what's hot right now. No, you went to a tailor that made your clothes, uh, and that's, that's, that's how it was done. Or, or if you had a person in your family that knew how to sew, you know, sew and make clothes, that's who did that. Um, so people came from far and wide for him. He was very talented very talented uh you can looking up looking him up people really sung his praises of how well of a tailor he was so he obviously learned his craft see see there we go so what happened and how did he do this with the patent so he received his patent on march 3rd 1821 the number of his patent is 3306X. I want you to remember that. That X is very important, and we're going to get to why that's important, okay? But remember that. So he received his patent March 3rd, 1821. Now, if some of you are doing some research, you're going to go, wait a minute, sister. He couldn't have got a patent. He was a black man. That, that wasn't going to happen. And you write. You write. Uh, if you were a slave and you was owned by your, ma you know, owned by your master, your master would apply for the patent because 
the thought process was the master owned you. So they owned your pet. I make the rules. I'm just telling y'all what happened. Okay. So, <laughs> but because Thomas L. Jennings was born a free man, that meant he was a citizen. So he was able to apply for a patent. So that gave him the rights that he was able to use his invention and profit from it. And one of the many, many things that he did, uh, he became quite wealthy. Uh, a lot of his family was still part of the slave trade. He paid for countless numbers of mem excuse me, for countless members of his family to be taken out of slavery. That wasn't cheap. So that means that there had to be a transaction with their master to pay for his family to get out of out of bondage. <sighs> Let's think about that. We, we, we're gonna talk about that for a second. Imagine having an uncle or auntie or cousin and in order to get them free, you got to go to the person that owns them and say, I want to buy their freedom. <sighs> I'm taking a pause here because it's hitting me. And I hope it's hitting you too. Uh, to my listening and viewing audience, I don't take it lightly that people that look like me weren't even allowed to read or to learn how to read. But, but the fact that this man, he got, he made it. He was born free. He could have said, you know what? I don't care about my family. Uh, I was born in New York. Uh, my mother or my parents or someone was already free while well, I was in New York. So uh, things were a little bit different there. Um, slavery, that was the whole time, before, you know, before the whole Civil War and everything. Um, he was born <laughs> free. He kind of could have said, that's, I was born in New York. My people are free. I'm good. But he didn't do that. He, he did not do that at all. I love that. I love that. So when, um, when he got his patent, there was actually uh, something in the paper that, that publicized his patent. Now, if you happen to be watching me, I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can see the newspaper article uh, of his patent. If you are listening, uh, just feel free to uh, come and watch the video and you'll be able to see the newspaper clipping of his patent. All right, so you can see it has letters patent and it has all this uh, <laughs> all this verbiage here, but it says Thomas L. Jennings has his address, 61 Nassau Street in New York, for his invention of the dry sc scoring clothes and woolen fabrics in general. So they keep their original shape and have the polish and appearance of new inform the public that he is ready to execute all orders entrusted to him in the above line. Wow. So, he also alters and repairs gentlemen's clothes in the 
in the neatest manner, being regularly brought up to the tailor business and practicing in the city the last 14 years. He also removes stains from cloth. Wow. Wow. This is history right here. This was in the New York Gazette, March 13th, 1821. So everything wasn't all roses for Mr. Gen for Thomas Jennings. Believe it or not, someone tried to come for him. Mr. Jennings, he was not to be played with. Let me tell you why. There was a rival Taylor that uh, started to use his invention and uh, Mr. Jennings sued him in the city's Marine Court and he won $50. <laughs> now you may say uh, $50 that's all he won. Think about how much how far that goes in this and during that time period okay. <laughs> The reason why is because he was able to provide his signed copy of his letters of patent. And for once again, for those of you who like to look at these things. So here you can see the patent letter that Jennings had in his possession, which is a good thing. And let me tell you a little story why. <laughs> so the U.S. Patent Office, which is what it was called back then, actually had a fire. As the story goes, <laughs> uh, we'll actually never be able to take a look at Thomas Jennings' patent. And this is the reason why. So, the U.S. Patent Office, at the time, they were getting a new building erected. So, for storing the patents, <laughs> they decided to store them at the Washington Blodgett's Hotel. So, this was where they stored the patents while they while their new facility was being built now keep in mind <laughs> there was a fire station next door to the facility but <laughs> there happened to be a fire and it was in the winter and the firefighters hoses were cracked in the cold so close to 10,000 or so patents were destroyed in a fire. And one of the patents that was part of this was the one from Thomas L. Jennings. So before the fire, patents didn't even have a number. They were just cataloged by their name and the issue date. After the fire, the patent office decided to number the patents. And any copies of burned patents that were obtained from the inventors were given a number as well, ending in X, to mark them as part of the destroyed batch. So remember when I told you, told you his US patent number was 3306X? That means his patent was destroyed in that fire. So, because of the patent letter that Jennings had, he was able to defend himself. To say, nah, son, you are not gonna try and use my process, my invention, you gonna pay me. Don't you just love it? <laughs> to some notable things about Thomas L. Jennings and his family. So I just wanna preface this with, this is what happens 
when I'm looking things up from like the 17 and 1800s, I get conflicting information. So most of the information says that Thomas Hell Jennings only had three children. But from other sources shows that he actually had five, uh, two girls and three boys. So I'm just going to talk about everyone because as far as I'm concerned, they all did good things. So it is what it is. <laughs> so uh, notable, one of the notable things about uh, Thomas L. Jennings, um, he, as you've already heard, he didn't just, you know, care about himself. He was part of the abolitionist movement. Uh, he became actually the assistant secretary uh, for the first annual convention of the people of color in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, that was a group that was established and he became the assistant secretary. He also was um, instrumental in helping to form other organizations. Uh, so obviously he didn't do it all by himself, but he was also part of part of, part with other business leaders instrumental uh, in establishing Freedom's Journal, and that was the nation's first African American newspaper. Jennings died in 1856. And that was when he was at the age of 68. Really lived a long life. That, that was a life, I feel that's long for a life expectancy back then. Uh, in his eulogy to him, uh, that was in the Anglo-African newspaper, Frederick Douglass called Jennings, and I said, and I said it, Frederick Douglass called Jennings a bold man of color who led an active, earnest, and blameless life. Those are the circles that he ran with. Wow. <laughs> wow. So some other notable things. Now, in my findings, I did find that they said there were, were more children and that one of the children actually started to work with Frederick Douglass. So let me get that. William, Jennings' oldest ch child, became an agent for African-American newspapers and an abolitionist leader in Boston. Another son by the name of Thomas served on anti-slavery committees with Frederick Douglass and was a renowned dentist and vestryman in New Orleans. Now, Jennings' wife and his daughters were active in the Female Literacy Society of New York. And I believe his son James also became a school teacher. So the other notable thing is that his daughter, Elizabeth, who from what I can tell was his youngest, she won, and I believe it was in 1854, a court decision that desegregated the New York City's public transit system. So, I just, this is, I didn't realize that it was segregated because up north, being that I'm from up north, they always talk about, you know, they were on the right side of history, but they still had segregation. So don't let people tell you that up north, where it's just where I am from, that it wasn't segregated. It was. So, <laughs> so the way the story goes, is that his daughter Elizabeth was using like uh, the services of public transportation. I believe it wasn't a bus, because I don't think they had buses back then, but it was more of like a streetcar. And it was her and I believe some other members of her church. And they were literally thrown off of the cart. So here's some more history. Thankfully, because of the wealth of her father, 
they were able to retain legal representation from the law firm of Culver, Parker, and Author. Now, you may say, why is this a big deal? Author was a young attorney by the name of Chester Arthur. If that name sounds familiar, it should, because he would later become the 21st president of the United States. So Elizabeth Jennings ultimately won her case in front of the Brooklyn Circuit Court in 1855. This whole family, wow. And now it's time for my commentary. Tiffany's thoughts. <sighs> Researching about Thomas L. Jennings really made me happy. Uh, I knew a little bit uh, about that there was a Thomas L. But no, no, let me stop. I knew there was a black person that invented something having to do with dry cleaning. I didn't know what they invented or what, the, what, I didn't know the whole story. It was just one of those things that I learned in passing. You know, I didn't learn it in school. Uh, that, <laughs> that really amazed me. This, he was born free and he cared about other people so much that he used his wealth to help get other people free and to further the cause of abolitionism back then. And it's obviously was something that was taught at home because look at what happened to his children. They all went forth towards that path. Um, I have to say, in researching this story, excuse me, it's not a story, in researching this topic of Thomas L. Jennings made me happy because for once I didn't see a deep, dark uh, story about a business owner. Now, I am 100% sure that Mr. Jennings, along with his family, faced some type of racism. Well, we already know that because of the legal case with his daughter. But what I mean is, I'm sure every day wasn't roses. I'm just, I'm, I'm just so sure of it. Um, He was a black man that learned a trade. Once again, his customers had a problem and he came up with a solution. This is my third installment of Brown and Money. And I think if you don't have a solution for your customers, there you go. <laughs> this is just something I very happy and ecstatic about learning about Thomas L. Jennings. So that has been the show of Brown and Money with an intimate portrait of Thomas L. Jennings. So if you want to hear more of stories like these, please subscribe to whatever platform you like to listen to the most, or you can feel free to subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and if you really like Brown and Money, please share it with your friends. I Sharing is so caring, but this knowledge, it helps to empower us. And never know who you could empower with this information. And if you would like for me to come talk to your group or organization, I would be happy to do so. I get asked this quite a bit. Uh, so... On my website, uh, there is a place where it says book me. Uh, the website is brownandmoney.com, just, like, um, <laughs> just, just like the show. Uh, you can put in a booking request, and we will get back to you, and, and we'll be happy to come out to your event or to your group or your function. Uh, I'm very, very happy with the reception that we've been, been receiving. So I just want to thank you for watching and thank you for listening. This has been Brown and Money. I am your host, Tiffany Tracy. You have a good one.
Yeah, I gotta keep it 100. Time to highlight the power people. Yeah, all the people of color. Yeah, you know this is brown and money. Brown and money, brown and money. This is brown and money. Brown and money, brown and money. Yeah. Yeah, tune in, this is major. major You know we gotta show love to the darker shaded movers and shakers For real, this is Brown and money, brown and money, brown and money This is brown and money, brown and money, brown and money, yeah